Good morning, everybody. Well, um, I, I, as you just heard, I'm here because Richard's not up yet. Uh, it's, uh, it's a, I think it's a four-hour time difference, uh, so you got me instead for this morning. So I, I've actually worked with, with Richard in 12 jobs uh, for the last 17 years. For the last five years, I've been really focused on climate change solutions, and, uh, uh, and that's what I'm here to talk to you about today. For the last two of those, I've been working one day a week with the Department of Energy and Climate Change as chair of their Energy Efficiency Deployment Office as well. Um, but really today is all about, as it says, taking a different view. I suppose in, 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 one, in one sense, I think all the entrepreneurs that are out in the room today, um, it's the same view, that, um, society, that actually climate change is our greatest opportunity currently masters a crisis, and anyone here that's working on the solution side of the ledger already sees this. And so I suppose my different view is, is we're a non-profit, a charity, uh, but absolutely focused on profit, um, as, you'll see, as you'll see in a second. And so for you that are already working on the solution side of the ledger, it's about looking a bit global and looking gigaton scale, um, and those that aren't yet, uh, hopefully we can chat about it. So in less than 20 minutes, uh, I, I'm, going to, I'm going to do a bit about the crisis itself, the crisis, the scale of the problem, and the pivot that we have to make as a world. Um, I want to spend a little bit of time on the entre an entrepreneurial approach, as in Carbon War Room's approach on what we've been doing in a couple of projects. So I suppose I'm the, I suppose the content and the project side of, 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 the, of the Richard interview, and obviously you can ask Richard all the whys and wherefores uh, when, when, you, when you see him uh, on the screen at 1.15, uh, 1.30. And then I want to close with an opportunity, uh, which I do believe it is, and hopefully there's something to do for every single person in this room. Um, so the first thing to make sure is, 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 is that we all know what crisis it is. One of our projects is in islands. Uh, somebody's, somebody's just asking me, so you've been to Necker? Uh, and the answer is yes, indeed. Uh, uh, not as, don't, don't get nearly so much time as I should. Um, so many of you uh, that grew up on Scotland's east coast will recognize this coastline, um, or maybe not, uh, from your holiday brochures anyway. Um, but the island is actually a really good way of looking at the problem. You know, sort of, you know, are we really in a, in a state of problem? You know, the, the world looks okay. But actually, this, uh, th this photo is taken around the corner of the same island. Um, and really, let's just you sort of put to one side um, all the normal NGO stuff that you hear about uh, biodiversity loss, uh, environmental, social, all the other mega trends that you're saying that you know, the world is, is not going to a great place right now. Let's just focus on, 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 a, on pure economics um, and, and through the lens of islands for a second. Um, GDP hit. Um, the Cook Islands, for instance, is not atypical. They use 39% of their GDP to import diesel in to generate power. Um, so it's a huge energy suck on, on, on their whole economy. On electricity prices, islands are typically 40 cents a kilowatt hour because of that reliance on imported diesel going into gensets. Um, 40 cents, 50 cents, sometimes over a dollar when around here it's 10, 10 15 is the world average. And then on volatility, they're all, these islands are also the first to get hit, first and worst hit. Um, Bahamas, for instance, when the, the world oil price went up 23%, in the same time, Bahamas utilities' costs of importing fuel went up 170 so the key point here is that there's enormous amount of stress just on a pure economic basis, and islands are actually, as you'll see in, in a few minutes, a great lens for that. Take it up to the global, though. Um, you know, sort of, I'm not here to really preach about this, but it's, it's kind of obvious, um, unless you're in the flat earth society. Um, temperature, nine out of the 10, of the, uh, nine of the 10 hottest years happened in the last decade. Um, the GDP has been measured at, at one and a half percent now, um, 3% by 2030, another new report out on that. Again, there's a poverty a twist, just like I talked about on islands. 11% is the forecast hit on GDP to the le least developed countries. And the impacts are already being felt, uh, whether it's the Philippines, whether it's the glaciers, um, whether it's the National Climate Assessment just put out in the, in the US just a few weeks ago, or Superstorm Sandy. It, 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 the impacts are obvious. Um, what, what I just wanted to get then to lift up the level, saying like, you know, when we started looking at this as well, saying, well, what is the scale of the shift that's required? What is this pivot that I just talked about? Seven, these are two useful numbers. 768 grams is the number of grams of CO2 it takes to generate $1 of GDP in the world today. That's just one big number divided by the other. In fact, that ball there is, 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 is the right sized ball of CO2 to take to generate $1 of GDP. Um, any guesses in terms of with all the mega trends uh, that I've just been talking about, what do we need to get to as a world for the size of that beach ball to, to, to reduce? 
I know it's early. Up this side, one, one guess. How small does the ball need to get to? Sorry? Tennis ball? This side? Squash ball? Actually, you know, sort of, you're all pretty close. I would say that's a slightly large tennis ball. But the key point is in the volume reduction, it's, it's 768 grams to six. So this isn't, if any of you are in big corporates, this isn't that lovely CSR report that you put out that says, look, we're 10% better compared to 2005 levels or whatever the figure is. This is a 99% shift in the global economy. This is a huge shift. And, and I think we all have to sort of take that on in, in, in whatever field we're in. Um, the other piece is there, uh, sorry, it's in, in white on white there, but the complexity of this is also quite potentially daunting. Um, the systems, it's food, water, energy, they're all, they're, they're all uh, connected. Um, lots of companies, potentially a couple in this room, their whole economic business model rely on the past being so uh, and the fossil fuel economy continuing. And then also lots of noble efforts. The countries have never yet been able to do this, whether it's at Copenhagen, Cancun, Durban or Bonn. We can't actually solve this yet. But the good news, and this is the pivot, onto the good news and what, what the huge opportunity is. And again, as I say, some of you are engaged in this already. We didn't get out of the Stone Age because we ran out of stones. There's still plenty of stones. There will also still be, I imagine, plenty of people driving around with Arnold Clark and Mercedes around Aberdeen as well. So the fossil fuel industry will continue, stones will continue, but the key point is the opportunity. And in that system and complexity actually probably hides the very opportunity that we've got. How many of you are familiar with the McKinsey cost curve or marginal abatement cost curve? Anyone heard of that? A couple of people in the audience. This is climate change on one graph. If you're in a restaurant and you draw it on a napkin, this is climate change, the solution sitting here, right here. It's just an S curve through uh, the x-axis. The size of the problem is their x-axis. How many tons of CO2 do we need to get rid of as a world every year? Whether This is actually sort of 17 gigatons. Um, and, and what do we need to do to get there? The strips are all the various initiatives from the wind, tidal, uh, offshore wind, energy efficiency, all the people in the room. That's all the solutions that get us across to the 17 gigatons. Some of them are very expensive. Paying Brazil to not chop down trees, working out carbon capture and sequestration of power stations, that is expensive. That's on the red side. But on the green side, there are things that we can do right now that get us across that mitigation and its negative cost to the economy. So somebody somewhere should be making a profit and, um, and getting the mitigation at the, same, at the same time. And so really, underneath that scale, there's actually lots of strips of opportunity. And underneath that complexity, there is huge business opportunity if we look at it from, the, from that left side. So if you think of governments having to take the, the right side, what are we doing on the left? Um, so Carbon War Room, as I say, it's a non-profit fixated by that profitable opportunity to take gigatons of carbon out the atmosphere. We cut the solutions up uh, like this. Um, um, no need to sort of look at the detail, but the inner seven rings are the problem, the carbon emission sources, and the strips around the side are places where we think there could be gigaton scale of uh, carbon reduction and massive amount of business opportunity at the same time. Just to be clear, we're focused on the business opportunity. Policy, necessary but insufficient condition to get things done. Technology is arguably not the bottleneck in most sectors. What, you really, what we really need to do is mobilize the capital into things that already make money. So there's two buckets and two case studies quite quickly. One is the bucket of go efficient. Go efficient on the left side means le using less of what is getting more expensive, harder to get at, and is dirty and polluting. So if we use less of that, then that's surely a good thing, and actually normally is economically very, very cost-effective to do so too. Um, our case study here is in maritime shipping, uh, obviously an unimportant industry locally as well. Um, but if you look at it at a global sector level, um, it's a billion tons of CO2, only 100,000 ships on the fleet, but it's the sixth largest country in the world if it was a country, those 100,000 ships. Um, it's an unflattering comparison, even though they, they, they're very carbon efficient relative to other modes of transport, um, it's an unflattering comparison to, 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 say, cars. One of the largest ships in the world is 50 million cars worth of socks. So only 15 of the largest ships in the world is the entire world stock of cars right now in sulfur oxides. Um, so that's the problem, but actually the great thing is the opportunity is huge. $70 billion a year could be saved in the, in the industry with technologies that already exist today. Uh, for those engineers in the audience, you could get quite excited about this slide. The, you know, sort of from the top left, 
quite boring but effective. The best paints in the world pay back in 10 months because they resist the biofouling and gl glide through the water. Wind technology is coming back. Um, uh, there's solar, there's waste heat recovery off the main engine, air bubbles going down under the hull. There's loads of technologies, 50, 60 of them, that could save $70 billion a year in fuel for the industry. So this isn't about a climate change, you must pollute less. This is you are leaving money on the table. So what is the problem? What is the, what is the, what's the obvious thing here that, you know, so why is this money just being wasted? And it turns out that there's two key market failures in the shipping industry when we convene people together. I think that's one of the advantages of having Richard at his head and my day-to-day my, my -day boss is the former president of Costa Rica, uh, Jose Maria Figueres. So the, the combination of the two of them, if we invite people to meetings, they tend to come, um, especially if you invite them on a nice island. And, 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 and the industry said uh, uh, in... in hotel rooms and, and, and conference rooms like this, there's two key market failures in shipping. One is poor information. It's hard to get to tell a clean ship from a dirty ship, whether you're on the demand side and you want to put your cargo on a clean ship, or you're on the supply side and you make a better ship than your competitors, uh, but you can't tell that to the market that effectively. Second market failure is split incentives. It turns out that 70% of the fuel in the industry is paid for by the cargo owner, not by the ship owner. So why would I, as a ship owner, put all the bells and whistles on my ship if uh, somebody else gets the benefit and because of the first market failure, um, nobody can really tell anyway. So economically rational people are leaving $70 billion a year on the table. So what we then did as Carbon War Room, as the nonprofit in the middle, is we try to create, as it says there, irreversible momentum to chase that money and actually do ourselves out of a, a job and a project in the medium term. The first one was solve for information. So a few years ago, we, we, we launched this thing called shippingefficiency.org. It is basically the A to G rating for every ship on the fleet. Much like you can go into John Lewis and you know how efficient the fridge is because there's a nice big colorful rating, why can't you go online, put the name of the ship in, and then get up the rating? That was launched a few years ago using data that was already available, an index that was already available on the, uh, in terms of a methodology from the IMO, and mash the two together and get it out there. It wasn't the perfect information at the time, it wasn't uh, the best, but it was the best available, and information in the sunlight will make a better market. So we launched that first. Then importantly, rather than try and change policy, go to the people whose pain this is. And so Cargill went out public in the, on the FT, that one is, um, a, a, a year later, and said, we will not use Fs and Gs. And they've been, since been joined by 26 other charterers saying, we will factor A to G into our chartering decisions. So now there's an economic incentive as a ship owner. Geez, my buyers actually, actually care about this index. On the carrot side, we've been going to ports. And now there's Prince Rupert and uh, Vancouver at the start of a, quite a few ports, hopefully, in giving carrots, as in dockage reduction fees, uh, sorry, reduction in dock fees um, for A and Bs, for instance, up to 40% in the case of that, that, that port that I mentioned. And then the last piece is the dollars, the money. What if you're a ship owner and you want to move, but you can't afford it? Um, you know, sort of they are a derivative of the major economy. What can you do next? Um, and so what we've done there is just like the market failure of what I said is, is, is sort of 70% of the fuel paid by the cargo owner, just like in buildings where there's a landlord-tenant uh, failure. Landlord can uh, or doesn't want to upgrade his building because the tenant will get the lower fuel bill. Tenant doesn't want to do it. It's not his building. So moving some of the mechanisms that are starting to unlock capital in buildings, we've pushed them into the shipping market and are gathering the same forces in consortiums in shipping to get the money moving from selfish capital that wants to make a return, paying technology firms who will now have a customer, free tech to the ship owner, and fuel savings to the charter. Everyone can win on this one. So fundamentally, you can look at this market hopefully in three, four years time and say, actually, this momentum is moving. This, this is a new normal in shipping, chasing those savings. So that's the go efficient bucket, just an example in terms of what you know, work we're doing and what we're doing with many others and partners that we rely on. The other exciting bucket of opportunity in this left side of the cost curve is go renewable. That means using more of what is clean it's getting cheaper all the time um, and getting more abundant all the time and always will be there. Um, so that's going on renewable. And take our project, and we, we you're mentioning, and you're going to be talking uh, to Richard uh, on his home in Necker, um, but islands face a unique time. And we've got an islands project. Um, 
focused on island governments initially in terms of flipping the whole island off fossil fuel. Because if you think of the cost curve facing an island, because they're importing diesel across long distances, actually their cost curve is nearly all green with just a little bit of red on the top right because th their, their electricity price is so high. The second piece is the technologies are really ready to go. I mean, I was excited to read the delegate list in terms of some of the pieces that are out there now and can actually prove themselves on some of these islands from marine wave, you know, sort of wave and tidal through to wind, solar. Some of these, some of these islands are in perfect spots for re re renewable technologies and meanwhile, very hard to get to from the point of view of a diesel infrastructure. Um, and then the third piece is island nations are really interesting because actually some of the people we're dealing with are, are, are less than the Norfolk field that good, good energy is building. Um, they are less than a 100 megawatt grid, but they've got a flag at the United Nations unlike the Norfolk field, and they thump the table and say, we've done it. We, fli we flipped our whole economy off fossil fuels. What are you going to do as big countries? And they can inspire the world by doing so. So that's why we're in islands. Um, as a demo island, um, um, we are actually are uh, sort of flipping necker off fossil fuels. So we tried the procurement. One of the values that we are bringing as our project is, is, is getting everyone, and some of you actually might be in this room, sharpening their pencils to actually turn islands off fossil fuels. And, and, and bring their best, their best game, but also their best prices. Um, and so we went out to tender uh, last year for flipping Necker off fossil fuels. Um, and I quite like this, uh, this is actually a sketch that Necker didn't go for in the end, but just to show you that actually solar can be beautiful. Uh, they've, they've actually mimicked a solar, uh, this is for, for the pitch, uh, a solar array uh, in the case of a, a native leaf of, of Necker Island, and that is Necker Island uh, from above. Um, so the idea there was to get everyone to sort of get onto a commercial process and accelerate that commercial process towards uh, the flip of the system. Um, the photo I did at the start, that's actually Aruba. It was spotted by uh, uh, our chair. Um, and um, that's the Divi Divi tree. And so what's really interesting about the Divi Divi tree and Aruba, not only are we there uh, helping them with their 100 megawatt system uh, to go off fossil fuels, but also the Divi Divi tree uh, goes in the direction of nature. Uh, it, uh, and, and maybe that's a time, uh, that, that's a sort of symbol to us all that actually uh, we can and, and, and flow with the direction of nature and use it to our advantage. So I've, I've given you two, two examples of, of projects that we're doing, but really these are two buckets of examples. There is a huge amount of opportunity with the, the buckets of go efficient and go renewable, using less of what's expensive and getting worse, and using more of what's getting cheaper and getting better. Um, just for our projects, we're looking at everything from buildings. First 20% is you can get a, a, of savings in buildings, virtually no cost. Um, that is an energy efficiency industry that is growing worldwide uh, like the blazes. Uh, trucking, uh, seven technologies in the trucking industry, for instance, pay back in less than 18 months. Uh, the shipping savings we've talked about, and there's a huge opportunity in big data and machine to machine. Nine gigatons of CO2 can come out of the economy in a trillion dollar business within M2M and much more besides. So I want to leave you with some uh, thoughts, uh, 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 from thoughts to potentially action for us all. The first piece, I think, is, is choice. We've all got a choice in this room. Now, whether you are a corporate that has to move, that has to make that 99% pivot in the economy, how are you going to do it? Where in the field are you going to go? There are so many classic sectors as well as disruptive sectors now where you really have to make a concerted effort as an entrepreneur, as a, com as a, as a company to say, where in the Buffalo field am I going to roam? Am I going to try and be at the lead edge and get onto this trend? Am I going to try and stay with the pack? Because otherwise I may not survive. The other piece I think is that you've got also got a choice as a consumer. And I think that's important for everyone in this room as well. Everything from the two examples I said, where do you go on holiday? Are you going to these eco destinations and, and do you have to fly this time? Um, through to um, the shipping, where is your product coming from? What is the story of the stuff that you buy? Through to the most basic thing for everyone in this room, and this is with my other hat on and deck, are you retrofitting your home? That's probably the thing as a consumer that um, will make your home more comfortable, more valuable, get control of your energy bill, um, and save carbon at the same time. And we're not all doing it in this room. So that, there's a huge choice there as a, as a corporate individual, as a professional, and as a consumer. Um, the, other th the other piece is watch for the trends. There are some big trends. I'm putting the elephant in the room there because it's obvious. You just watch them. Resources are getting more scarce. This will take two tr big trends to watch for in, in the areas you work in. One in technology, what's coming down the pike and what's already proven. But the other piece is business model. 
Zipcar is a business model innovation, it's not a technical innovation, and that, is sweep, that will sweep car travel. And there's many more besides. The, share, the whole utilization and sharing business model is sweeping a number of sectors and taking people in, their, in its path. So watch for the big trends. The third one is collaborate. And I love this uh, slide in, in different halls that we go into, but Aberdeen especially. This is the meeting of the old and the new energy. Um, and, and often the skills that we all need might be in the old one. Um, and, and, and the new ones might need from the old and the old from the new. Um, in, the, in the energy efficiency business, um, you know, the roofer might have to go together with the glazier and, and, get, and become an, an energy efficiency solution. So old rivals um, can collaborate. And then the last piece I want to leave you with is, 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 three, is three questions. One false one and, 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 two, and two real ones. The, fa the, the false question is, is there a choice between the economy and the environment? Because if you have a sufficiently long time horizon, that is actually a completely irrelevant and wrong question to ask. There is no choice between the economy and the environment. This is the same thing. And the real, the, but I suppose the two real questions I wanted to leave you with is, you know, like, are, are you doing, are, am I doing, are we all doing as much as we can with the skills that we have? And I suppose the biggest question of all of those as well, and I think about it because We've just got a brand new daughter in the family, um, tiny little kids, and you're thinking like, as, as, as a grandparent coming up hopefully, you're sitting there with the grandkid on the knee, and they've, they've just read about the history that is happening right now, this whole sort of mid 2000s into 2010 and beyond, and they, they read about this time, and they said, what, and they ask you, what did you do when the world knew what, what you were supposed to do? What did you do? And I think that's a really important question for us all uh, to ask. And, and I think the great thing about coming to speak to an audience like this is you've probably all made that decision or, or already thought about it. So thank you very much for your time. Um, talking of time, there isn't much time left. There is no planet B. Uh, this is the one we've got. Let's make the most of it. And very happy to work with you all. Thank you.